Okay, so I got this at the auction a little while back when I got the robot arm. It was in a lot of a bunch of other stuff. And a Lambda LP 522FM with a 0 to 40 volt um, output with a maximum rating of 1.8 amps. It's a beefy power supply. Um, you can see barely through the side here, the circuit board. But let's pop the case open and take a closer look at what goes on inside it and see if this puppy actually works. It's pretty straightforward to get into. There's just a set of three screws, I think, on either side of this case, which I think is just a clamshell and we'll just pull off the top. Okay, so that lets us pull the case off and we have... A look at the interior which is a little bit dusty um, which you would probably expect for a device of this vintage I don't see anything obviously super bad except for some discoloration of the board here which you would expect because it's right beside this power supply even though they got this sheet of metal here that uh, should provide some measure of thermal protection but it's actually just a uh, part of the case, so I'd imagine this whole thing heats up. This is one beefy uh, heat sink back here. Um, are these copper? Are these just some sort of... Yeah, no, that's just an anodized aluminum heat sink. But then look at the chunky... Uh, chunky pieces of alumina, aluminum that the uh, power transistors are mounted to. So, um, so yeah... That's pretty beefy. Does anything look terrible there? No. We've got um, thermal cutout here. And yeah, so it's a linear power supply. Fuses are inside here. We've got two 3 amp fuses. Um, so those would mean, that would mean that somehow line voltage is coming into here first, I would presume, if it's not if it's not fusing line voltage that would be unfortunate um, hmm. but it does need a good cleaning that's 100% for true uh, FBT 034 a Motorola IC wondering what that's controlling let's get the uh, fire extinguisher ready and plug her in So far, nothing. And let's contact. No, oh, something's twitching over here. Don't know if you can see that. Let's get some light on it. <clears throat> something's twitching over here. All right. But just barely getting out of the door. And now nothing. And oh, I had that current all the way up at the top. Um, is it producing any voltage when it's over here? It says that it's producing voltage. Uh, it's kind of all over the map, bouncing around. That doesn't look very good. Just like the uh, just like the needle on the analog meter. So yeah, not exactly a happy camper. Um, we'll have to investigate that, and maybe we can take a look for a service manual on the Googler and. Maybe we get lucky. I don't know. Let's go see if we can get lucky on the Googler. And I was successful on the Googler and found this um, uh, with a Google search for the model of the power supply. It includes things like the theory of operations. Oh, there's a service section and parts ordering. Oh, all right. Okay, theory of operation. Maintenance. Whenever trouble occurs, check 
all fuses, primary power lines, external circuit elements, and its external wiring for malfunctions before troubleshooting the equipment. Check that you haven't done something silly before you think that it's your power supply. Yeah, that's reasonable. Trouble chart is intended as guy. There we go. Okay. Zero volts DC output. No, that's not our problem. Unable to adjust output voltage. Damaged output voltage controls. Check R1 and R2 for shorts are open and replace as necessary. Okay, well, we can start there. Parts list. Uh, common parts are... No, that's not part of the common parts. I have 20 unique parts. The 522 are... 1 and R2. Dual variable wire wound 8,000 ohms? Wow. That's pretty specific. And I don't think they're made <laughs> today. Uh, maybe I should just call up Lambda and give them their, um, their product code and uh, check for 550 and see if they'd send me one. Might be fun just for the grins. Okay, well, let's check that just to see if we have to replace it anyways, and then um, we'll go from there. Okay, before working on electronics equipment, unplug from mains voltage. Um, and while we're at it, discharge any crazy big capacitors to avoid nasty surprises. R1 and R2 are, I'm guessing, are these guys. And how do they feel? Uh, a little rough. That one doesn't feel too bad. Oh. Can you hear that? The other one doesn't feel like that at the bottom of its travel. Um, hmm. I wonder if that's where our problem lies. Let's see if we can measure some voltage or some uh, resistance on here. Wow, it just bounces around. And then it's open load. Yeah, it just bounces around like we saw on the dis on the internal meter. So I'm guessing that it's these pots, which is unfortunate because they say it's an 8K plot. And when is the last time anybody has seen an 8K potentiometer? That's craziness, absolute insanity. Now, how do we get at that thing? Okay, so there's two screws here that look like they will release that bracket. There's another bracket, so I think maybe... Is there one on that side? Yeah. I think those two and those two are the next line of attack. Yeah, that allows us to pull off the front cover, and then we need to get into these knobs to take these pots out and how much clearance do we have so it looks like they're wired up in series so it goes into there and then it goes to the wiper and then that goes to that wiper and then the wiper goes out so yeah these two pots are wired in series and we just have to figure a way to get in to those okay knobs off let's open up this guy with the exactly the wrong tool. Well, not exactly the wrong tool. Clarostat. 200 ohms. 7.8 K. Impossible to find. Impossible. So there's our offending component right there. It doesn't look like it's rocket science to get in there. It does say wire wound. Is there a possibility that once we get in there, we can see a way of repairing it? I mean, you can't, I can't break it any more than it's already broken, right? So let's just 
gently pry these tabs back a bit and see what happens when we try and get in here. Okay, so that's joining those two together. Oh yeah, I should probably um, desolder the, the two of them. Okay, oh, the center one is the low pot. Okay, so we have a way of ingress to here, it looks like, and we just need to pull a couple of tabs back here. And this is the outer pot. And this is the one that felt kind of grody. And once again, we have two tabs, three tabs here and here. Okay, so let's pop those tabs open. And I am just gently prying... <clears throat> catching a lip of the knurling on the edge of the tab and pulling it back. And now I need to get a little more clearance on these so it comes off cleanly. And let's see what we got. Okay. So what we have in here is our wiper. So let's measure some resistances on this and see if that rings true. 8k you say. But no, it gets a 0k. Open load that way. So that little notch in there. So <clears throat> yes, as I suspected, this is a snap ring. And to get a snap ring off is a weaselly little picking at it with whatever tiny little picker thing you've got to try and get it out of there. And then <clears throat> it's just what you got to do. All right. So that gives you a wiper. And that wiper connects to the other side of there. That wipes on the on this so as this pops in here that is a u-shape and so those two contacts contact onto that electrode and bob's your uncle so now we've got a bit of a better view at what's going on with this thing and there should be continuity between there and there and again. All right, now we just need to check some continuity. Okay, so that's just the the contact coming up and around and going into there. But as soon as we start moving off of there, we lose continuity. Because it should go like this. We should get continuity all the way around. So, there's two things that we can do. We can reverse, <laughs> reverse the direction um, so that we turn clockwise to decrease in a wire wound resistor. We have a bunch of turns around a, a bunch of turns of, of wire around a form. And then as this wiper rotates around it, you're taking in more and more turns of wire, um, which means that you're getting more and more resistance because resistance is linear on length of your um, material. So the farther away from this, um, this terminal we are, the higher the resistance is going to be. But there is a short here. So that means that this is infinite resistance. But there is no short on this side, as we showed by doing this measurement here. So we've still got a potentiometer on this side. The problem is that now 
we are rotating in the opposite direction to get higher um, resistances. In this scenario, we're rotating counterclockwise to get higher resistances, but in this scenario, we're rotating clockwise to get higher resistances. So what the problem is, increase the voltage, we're going to have to turn it counterclockwise, which is going to be counterintuitive. So what I'd rather do is try to figure out where the fault is on this side and try and fix it that way, unless we can invert this. But I doubt that that's flexible. It might be. But I think I would run more risk of damaging it. So I would rather try and figure out where this is broken and try and mend it by throwing a little blob of solder in there, perhaps. Um, and uh, see where we get. Okay. Maybe it's time to look at that under the magnifying glass. You know, that actually just looks like it's worn out. I wonder if I can even solder to that. And just a little blob of solder, which wouldn't last very long. I'd have to... Huh. Because it looks like that is just wrapped up around the whatever this material is. And then it was making some sort of a connection. I wonder if I can flow some solder onto there. It might be worth trying. Okay, so to pull this guy out is pretty straightforward. Just bend these terminals, and then this guy pulls out, and we see what we've got <clears throat> much more clearly. So, it looks like I need some sort of mechanical interconnection between the um, the windings here and this terminal here. So how are these? If I could pull a couple of those off and then get them across there to make a mechanical connection, I might be able to be back in business. I wonder. Oh my god. Huh. <laughs> I don't like that the wiper will be going up over it, and that'll just wear it out pretty quick. So I think I'm going to try and apply it on the other side. But I think that might work. Okay, so I gently fed it up underneath here. And then, so that means that I'm going to have a fairly robust mechanical connection there that extends through there. And do I have continuity? I sure do. Um, I'll probably have to uh, clean that. No, do I clean that wiper? Yeah, I'll probably clean that wiper a bit with some pot cleaner. Let's just get this by baby back together. Um, I wonder if this was a metal or if that's a plastic. Now, I still don't think I could invert that plastic to get. Um, I mean, that would be the next. That would be the next thing I tried in terms of fixing it. But this looks like a reasonable man. Back when they actually put in mechanical strain relief before they soldered up wire connections. Man, that was the day. Now, we just have to get this little puppy back together. Hopefully, hopefully, we can uh, we can manage that. From there, that extends through there. And do I have continuity? I sure do. Um, I'll probably have to... Yes! There we go. Okay, now. Uh, clean that 
Hmm. Do I clean that wiper? Yeah, I'll probably clean that wiper a bit with... Uh, uh. Continuity! Oh, finally! Okay. That should be zero. That should be about 8K. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, one pot down. One pot to go. Okay, does this pot have the same problem? Uh, measuring. Oh, yeah. Oh, this one might be easier to fix because I can see the little wire there. So I might, well, might be able to take that one winding off and run it underneath there. But um, yeah, same problem. Both of the pots failed in the same way. How unsurprising. So there we have a little piece of the broken wire that came from in here. So what I'm going to try and do is find the other end of that somehow. It's going to be around here somewhere. There we go. And that needs to get mechanically interconnected with this thing here somehow. Okay, wonder if that works. Ta-da! And the coil now measures very close to 200 ohms. <clears throat> All right, let's put that puppy back together. So on the internal pot, <clears throat> there is a, a keyway, or a keyhole. Let me just zoom in a bit. So we can see what's going on here. See what I'm talking about. <clears throat> there is a key. Uh, come on, lighting. Damn it. There we go. So you can just barely, see, I don't know if you can see it in there. There's that keyway. So that needs to um, be nestled down. This this uh, this yoke, hmm, what would you call that? Would you call that a yoke? You have to pull it up and nestle it in there so that um, it produces tension um, against the... Uh, put some tension on the wiper against the um, the coil. And then we can clamp it down. Just uh, not that anybody would ever do this kind of a repair. I mean, really, it's totally impractical. But I've heard that those Lambda power supplies were were quite um, quite the uh, quite the lab power supply at one point. <clears throat> Very well regarded. Now, what do we got? 
Much better. Much better. There we go. Okay. Now, let's get this all back together and see what we got. Okay, now when we adjust our potentiometer, that's adjusting the center, and it goes from about, well, roughly 2 ohms, what was that? 1 ohm up to roughly 200, and then put that back down to 0, and now the outer potentiometer, which is the course adjust, goes up to... k when I crank up the center plot. So yeah, so 8k going from 0 to 8k with coarse and fine. So potentiometer is working now. Let's plug her back in and see what we get. Light comes on. Oh, it's looking a bit better, but still not perfect. Does that just mean we found other problems? Quite possibly. Well, that was not the only problem then probably some capacitors in there that need be need to be replaced and uh, that'll probably be our next our next step it came this little capacitor and it looks like it is seeing better days it's all puffy um, it is a now there's some confusion between what's labeled on here, which looks like 2.5 microfarads. Uh, 100 volt. 100 volts. Eibies. Um, and what's listed on the what's listed on the um, uh, the parts list. It says it should be three. Lo and behold, I have a 3.3 100 in my capacitor bin. So let's pop that in, see what happens. I don't know why, but I just love old circuit boards. The hand-drawn quality of them. They just, they just look like art somehow. They just look like art. Plug it in. Turn it on. Let's give it a bit of current. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha. Ho ho ho. I think we've got a winner. One capacitor. Well, and of course the, uh, that is a fine adjust. One capacitor, and then of course the problem with these potentiometers. So we've got a nice 24 volt, or 40 volt, um, 3 amp, 1.8 amp power supply. At least it looks like it's producing well. We can do some tests on things like uh, Ripple, but um, so far I think we've got ourselves a successful repair. Okay, so we've got a, um, a load tester um, hooked up so that we can test the, um, the power supply under load. Um, right now it is not, um, I'm do I don't have the load on, so we're going to set a voltage, let's say 20 volts roughly, and Let's give it mostly maximum current. So as we can, yeah, let's preset it to 
well, let's not just get carried away right at the beginning. Let's give it about an amp of current draw and see what happens to the power supply when an amp of current draw kicks in. And nothing should happen. Yeah, the, looks like the voltage stayed pretty stable and the current is reading roughly one amp, 1.07 amps actually. So yeah, and then as we amp up the current, ah, yeah, so we've got our current clipping here. So let's set it to max current and see what max current is. Should be around 1.8 amps. So we're drawing, we're drawing 179, 180, 185. Okay, so that's not bad. Above what the label says, anyways. And then what happens when we turn the load off? The voltmeter doesn't change very much at all. So the power supply seems pretty solid. Um, the last thing that we wanted to do was measure the um, the noise, and so we'll point the camera up at the oscilloscope. I'm just doing um, a crude measurement of the total noise. I'm not going to do. I don't have the equipment to do any differential um, uh, me signal measurement of the of the load, so I can't get all fancy there. It's just a crude measurement of whether or not there is any ripple or how much ripple and noise there is on the power supply. So yeah, we'll do that next. Okay, so that's looking at the noise. Um, 500 microvolts per division, so that would be about two millivolts peak to peak, it looks like. Um, uh, because we're probably up around here, down to around here. So, yeah, one, two millivolts peak to peak. But not all of that would be the power supply. Some of that would be common moon noise because, well, there's fluorescent lights in here and the fans running and things like that. So, um, I, probably not all of that is due to the power supply. So it's not exactly meeting its spec anymore, but <laughs> why would you anticipate that something this old would still meet its specification. Um, but still, having 2 millivolt ripple isn't, isn't too terrible, I don't think. Um, not on a 20 volts of... of uh, uh, well, it depends on the application. But, uh, but yeah, um, seems like a pretty reasonable um, value to have. I should probably compare it to some of the other power supplies that I got kicking around here to see, um, see how it compares. So, yeah, maybe we should do that. Okay, so that's my uh, GW um, GPC 3020 power supply. So um, it's got about a millivolt of ripple. So I probably would do well checking the uh, some of the other componentry inside of that uh, that Lambda power supply um, to see if I can get that um, that noise floor down. But um, that's so. Thanks for watching, and talk to you later. Bye for now.